our spiritual gifts for today. Paul speaks of the gifts regularly in this context, one body with many members. Well, we still have one body, and we still have many members with different gifts today as well. Paul gives us a sample with different lists focusing on different kinds of ministries. And if you, if you put these together, the samples include things like giving, teaching, prophesying, speaking wisely, healings, worship leading, evangelism. All these are, are gifts. Paul makes no distinction with one kind of gift and another because we're not supposed to look down on any other gifts. We're supposed to welcome all the gifts. He doesn't make any distinction between supernatural and what we would call potentially natural gifts because it's God working through all of them. It hurts the body if any of the gifts are missing, whether the hand or the eye and so on. Well, today we're still a body. We still need all the members. Presumably, we still need all the gifts. Some in the Western world today say we just need the natural gifts. But not only is there no distinction given in Paul's lists, but this idea that, well, we don't need all the gifts, we don't need the supernatural ones, is really undermined uh, by his theology, first of all, because everything is supernatural, all these gifts are empowered by God. But secondly, it's undermined by Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. The gifts, he says, are needed to bring the body to maturity and unity. And the gifts he lists include not only teachers, but also prophets. He also includes apostles there, not meaning one of the twelve or writers of scripture. Uh, Paul uses the term apostle more widely than that. For uh, Sometimes we speak of missions or the different interpretations of exactly what Paul means there. But in any case, um, he doesn't just speak of what we call natural gifts. He also speaks of what we call supernatural gifts. It's a completely arbitrary modern distinction between them based on a modern worldview. Prophecy appears in nearly all of Paul's lists. Romans 12, 6, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Ephesians 4, 11. In the Old Testament, this was the most prominent ministry of God's word. In the New Testament, we also see prophets. We see prophets running around in the book of Acts, uh, the Corinthian churches, uh, what Paul says to them, apparently it was ideal to have multiple persons prophesying in each church. He speaks of prophecy as particularly valuable for building up Christ's body in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4. He urges believers to seek it in chapter 14, verses 1 and 39, probably by implication also in 1231. Even if we didn't know of true prophecies today, obeying Paul's teaching here, would lead us to pray for it in the church. Now that doesn't mean that everybody has it to the same degree. Um, Romans 12, 6 tells us that, you know, it's, it's according to the measure that's, that's given to us. We have these gifts. Um, Samuel could tell people where their lost donkeys were. Um, not one of his words fell to the ground. We don't see all the prophets in the Old Testament on that level, and we certainly don't see it in the local churches on that level. But some say, well, saying that prophecy is for today uh, or, or that kind of gift is for today diminishes the unique authority of Scripture. Well, that argument is an argument that's not from Scripture because prophets in biblical times prophesied it didn't diminish the authority of Scripture that already existed at that time. We have prophecies whose, uh, prophets whose prophecies were not recorded in Scripture. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 um, speaks of Obadiah tells Elijah about hiding a hundred prophets by fifties in a cave, but their prophecies aren't recorded in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 14 speaks of prophecies in the local church which are not recorded in Scripture. In fact, if, if what Paul says is the ideal for Corinth were in fact very common in the early church, by the time Paul's writing, there may have been 10,000 prophecies in the early church, most of which the vast majority of which are not recorded in Scripture. The Bible isn't meant to contain all prophecies. The Bible contains genres besides prophecy, history, and so on. So it's, it's, it's not the same thing to say that, that uh, if it's prophecy, it has to be in the Bible. And if it's not in the Bible, then it's not prophecy. That, that is not a biblical argument. Some say, well, if you allow for prophecy, you allow for new doctrines. Well, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 shows us that Christ is the fullest revelation. That's the fullest revelation we're going to get until Jesus comes back and we know him even as we are known. But we also read in Scripture 
that the Holy Spirit continues to teach us. John 14, 26, John 16, 12 to 14, there are things you can't bear now, he'll teach you afterwards. 1 John 2, 27, you all have an anointing from the Holy One. Prophecy is not meant to introduce new doctrines today, but the idea that the gifts have ceased is, is, is a new doctrine. It's not mentioned in Scripture. It's a post-biblical doctrine complaining about post-biblical doctrines. We have prophesying all through Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, some more in some areas than in others, some in more periods than in others, but nowhere does Scripture suggest a change of this way of working for after Scripture is completed. Like, oh, I was in the middle of a prophecy, but hey, it's 95. Um, Revelation just got finished somewhere, and now the canon's closed. I can't finish my prophecy. Th there's no indication of that anywhere in Scripture that that's what we're to expect. In fact, the one Scripture that people have sometimes cited for that, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, doesn't work for that. They say, well, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge will pass away. They pass away together. Knowledge elsewhere in 1 Corinthians includes things we know about God and maybe other kinds of knowledge, uh, something like the gift of teaching. Well, has the gift of teaching ended? It says that this will happen, these will pass away when we don't need these partial things anymore because we'll know them face to face. We'll know even as we are known. That's not talking about the canon. We still need teaching. It's talking about the second coming of Christ. In the book of Acts, it speaks of the Spirit being poured out in the last days with no implication that the Spirit gets poured back. There are uh, expressions that this text mentions of this last day's outpouring. And we shouldn't think that if that was the last days were earlier than the last days were back then. Features of this end time outpouring include prophecy, visions, and dreams from God. <clears throat> we have diverse ministries and acts. Not everybody has exactly the same expressions of the empowerment of the Spirit. But the ones that he chooses to emphasize there show us something about God's work between the first and the second coming. We, we see things in terms of the proclamation methods in Acts. You have very educated people like Stephen, Paul, and Apollos. It can be in debate contexts. Uh, two of them had signs and wonders as well, but uh, Apollos isn't put down because it's not mentioned in him. John the Baptist isn't earlier put down because he doesn't you know, have healing or something like that. But in many, many other cases, uh, not just, not just um, these people, but uh, many others, and not just apostles, but Stephen and Philip and others also have uh, healings and things like that following uh, to, to confirm the message that they're proclaiming. Uh, we have it a number of times in the book of Acts. We have a prayer for boldness coming with healings in, in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 and 30, signs attesting the message of God's grace in Acts chapter 14 and verse 3. If we're still preaching the gospel today, especially in unevangelized regions, we can expect signs to follow. Now, some people will say, okay, that, that happens, but, but not the gifts. But, um, but some of these overlap with some things that are also considered gifts. Preaching the kingdom, Jesus demonstrated God's reign with signs. Um, Paul says that uh, dramatic signs accompanied his evangelism, uh, Romans 15, 19. Uh, we, we still have them going on all through the book of Acts, including at the end of Acts, Acts chapter 28. Uh, if you don't like the idea of gifts of healings in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, says that the elders should pray the prayer of faith for the sick. Um, now, healings of that nature don't have to be signs. They don't have to be dramatic. Uh, it can be an answer through prayer if it happens through doctors. It can be an answer through prayer if it happens gradually. Um, there's still answers to prayer. But the kind of dramatic signs that accompany the gospel, we still see them today in, in the places where the gospel is breaking new ground. Why would God want work one way throughout most of Scripture in various times and places, sometimes more in one than in another, but various times and places, and then suddenly stop without prior warning at the end of the first century. Isn't it more biblical to expect that we should follow the same pattern that we see throughout Scripture? Namely, that in various times and places, as God deems best, and as people welcome His work, the work goes on. The gifts continued through history, 
Irenaeus speaks of roughly the same range that we have in the book of Acts. The leading cause of conversion in the 300s, according to Yale historian Ramsey McMullen, was healings and exorcisms. Augustine once believed the gifts had ceased, but changed his mind, at least with certain things, with healings, certainly. Uh, early Methodists, including Wesley, emphasized it. Uh, 19th century Lutheran pastor Johann Christoph Blumhart. Uh, today, some associate up to 80% of global growth with signs and wonders taking place on the cutting edge of evangelism. Still, we need discernment. Not all spirits are from God, 1 John chapter 4 shows us. Uh, even in the church, we need to evaluate prophecies, 1 Corinthians 14, 29. We, we shouldn't despise them, we should evaluate them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but don't drown it there either. Uh, we, we need to seek the gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 and 14, 1, 14, 39. We're to seek spiritual gifts, not all of them for ourselves, but for the body as a whole, to build up Christ's body. And we may be surprised what God will choose to do as we welcome God to gift each of us for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Mm -hmm.